My name is Brad Bollinger. I'm the publisher of the North Bay Business Journal and welcome to our first ever virtual events. I appreciate you uh, joining us here this morning. There are 735 people registered, so you're not alone. We appreciate the response. And again, thank you for being with us here this morning. So this launches uh, the Business Journal's virtual event series. We're starting here today to talk about where we're at and then where we might be six months, a year down the road. And then uh, starting in June, we'll be doing virtual industry conferences on wine, construction, and healthcare. In July, we'll also be doing our awards events virtually starting with 40 Under 40 next week. We're going to have a, a lot of fun with that one. So we know we cannot do in-person events. No one can at this point, but we're going to try to do the next best thing here on Zoom. We're doing this really for three reasons. Number one, we have as a news organization an obligation to keep the public informed. And then secondly, uh, we at the Business Journal have been doing for three decades, we bring people together here on this virtual platform today. And we do this knowing there's significant pain in our community and we want them to know they're not alone. Those who have lost jobs or their businesses are suffering, we want you to know that we're here with you, that we're committed to finding the best solutions uh, that will benefit and uplift everyone. So we are presenting this conference free to attendees. As I mentioned, there's 735 of you uh, here as a service to the business community. So please join me in thanking our sponsors who made this possible here this morning. And, you know, uh, we can't applaud them, but perhaps um, as, I, as I read them, you can give them a little way. Perhaps you know someone at one of these companies or organizations, maybe you can think of them in your mind. So uh, please join me in a little wave to our, our sponsors here, American River Bank, Bank of Marin, BPM, which was the first one on that gave us the momentum to keep going. Interwest Insurance Services, Poppy Bank, and Redwood Credit Union, and then a special thanks to our leading business organizations that helped us uh, get the turnout here today. The North Bay Leadership Council, Santa Rosa Metro Chamber, San Rafael Chamber of Commerce, and the Sonoma County Alliance. Thank you to all of them. So here's how it will go this morning. We're going to begin with our keynote, Julie Klaus, who is the um, director for the uh, SBA in the San Francisco region. And then we'd be followed by a panel uh, to talk about kind of where we're at in terms of tourism, the economy, and then also from uh, Terry Hill from BPM, whose feet on the ground has been talking to a lot of businesses uh, and, and has you know, a sense of what's going on and where we're, and where we're headed. So by the way, uh, if you have a question, submit it to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We've disabled the chat for this uh, particular event and we will get your questions via the Q&A uh, button. So with that, I want you to please welcome uh, Julie Klaus, who's the District Director of the SBA in the San Francisco office, where she oversees the SBA's programs and services within 14 counties in Northern California and prior to joining the San Francisco District Office, she was Deputy District Director of the SBA, uh, SBA's Washington Metropolitan, office, uh, Metropolitan Area District Office. She's been pretty busy, Julie, and uh, I'll bet she's sorry she answered my email and said yes to be here this morning, but we appreciate everything that you're doing. And please welcome uh, Julie Klaus. Thank you. Thank you, Brad, and to the whole team at North Bay Business Journal. Um, I do appreciate the invitation and the chance to talk to, um, to everyone this morning. And I am going to do a screen share, so bear with me for one second. And I, I do want to provide some updates today, uh, but before I even launch into all of that, um, I wanted to uh, just kind of do a little bit of, of context, if you will. And sorry, I'm trying to. <laughs> While we talk about all these different programs, um, you know, there's there's a lot there's a lot to think about. SBA is a small agency with a really big mission, and you know, under normal conditions, we're there to help start, build, grow, and recover 
small businesses. Uh, the recovery piece is usually not the most dominant of what we do. Uh, but in this situation, obviously that surged to the forefront and we had a little known program, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, that was the first uh, tool, resource available to help small businesses kind of start to combat the effects that COVID-19 was having. And certainly when this started, I mean, thinking back to, you know, mid, early to mid-March seems like a year ago almost at this point, and what we know now versus what we knew then, um, it's been a really, you know, crazy, challenging, scary um, ride for all of us. And we've had new programs created through the CARES Act um, and, you know, not having the luxury of time to prop up a new program uh, in the manner that we normally do. We had to literally launch this uh, and, you know, build this airplane as we're flying it. Uh, or maybe an overused saying, but I think the most perfect one in this situation. So is it perfect? No. Uh, but these are the tools that we have available. Um, we have been able to assist a lot of businesses, and I do have a little bit of data I can share with you at the end of the presentation. And I know there's still a lot of questions because certainly, um, you know, we're not through the end of this, not, not in the least. Um, we're used to disasters, right, where there's a start date and an end date. Um, and in this particular case, we, we don't have an end date. Uh, we're still kind of in survival mode and trying to figure out what the next phases look like. So I appreciate the invitation to be here today to kind of talk you through a little bit of, of the programs and then also to let you know that SBA and our team of resources still stand by you and ready to help you through whatever these next phases might look like. Uh, so please continue to reach out to us and our resource partners. Um, with that, I just want to do a quick recap on some of the assistance that is available today. Um, the financial assistance we have, and there's two different, um, I like to put them in two different buckets. This debt deferment and relief bucket and then the loan bucket. And because I know many of you may have been affected by the wildfires, I did want to let you know that um, if you have existing SBA disaster loan debt, um, we have automatically gone ahead and deferred your loan payments through the end of the calendar year. So you didn't have to do anything to activate this. We went ahead and did this automatically. You should see this reflected in your monthly notices. Um, and another tip for you, if you're someone who puts your bills on like an auto pay and you want to take advantage of the deferring of these payments, please make sure you go in and cancel your auto pay because that's not something SBA can do on your behalf but we have deferred those payments. Um, the second piece of, uh, that didn't get a lot of publicity, but it was also part of the CARES Act, and I think it's a tremendous benefit for anyone who has existing SBA debt. Um, this is our debt relief program. So if you have 7A debt, 504 program, or even microloan debt, SBA is going to pay the principal and interest for six months on this existing debt. So as long as your debt is in good standing, SBA will pay the six months of principal and interest. Um, and this, is, uh, this includes existing debt, and if you are someone who's in the process of maybe even getting another loan, um, I'm seeing this mostly in the 504 program, people who are maybe in the process of buying real estate for their business. Um, as long as if you acquire new debt, um, we have up until September 27th, we can also just uh, pay six months of the principal and interest. So please uh, talk to your lender if you have not already done so, or if they haven't already reached out to you and, and make sure that they enroll you in this program. But let's talk a little bit more about the, the two main uh, programs that got a lot of attention, the Paycheck Protection Program and the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. Um, first off, the both programs, um, went through the first round, if you will, both ran out of funding at different points in time. But they have both reopened, albeit with a, a little different. The Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program has reopened and the, the link is available, the application's available on our website again. But currently, only agricultural businesses may apply. And the reason for this is that with this fourth round of legislation that gave us some more funding, um, also expanded the eligibility criteria for this program to include agricultural businesses. So because they were excluded previously, right now we have an open window for those, for agricultural businesses to apply. 
This includes the, the regular EIDL program plus the EIDL advance, which is that up to $10,000 advance that is forgivable, and that is calculated as $1,000 per employee. The Paycheck Protection Program, though, is, is open. It opened a uh, second round, if you will, opened April 27th, and it is still available. There is still funding available. Um, the, to quick compare and contrast the programs, I mean, as the name alludes, Paycheck Protection Program focuses more narrowly on payroll. Um, eight weeks of payroll can be paid, and if you use the loan proceeds in the manner that they were designed to be used, you can have the loan forgiven. Um, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, on the other hand, is a working capital loan, and it was there to cover business needs, uh, your basic business operating expenses, the things that you could normally have paid, but for the effects that COVID-19 was having on your business. So the PPP loan, just a quick over for, uh, review, is, like I said, for payroll. And payroll in this, co uh, payroll costs in this context is a wider definition. Um, it's not just compensation, such as salary and wages. It can also include extra things that you might have to pay, um, like employee health benefits. If you have a group health coverage program, for example, you could use the premium costs. And state and local taxes that are assessed on employee compensation. All that goes bundled up into the payroll cost definition. The only non-payroll type expenses you can use some of these funds for are mortgage interest, rent, and utilities. So again, the focus is payroll. Um, in order to have the loan forgiven, you must use at least 75% of your loan proceeds on these payroll costs, and no more than 25% on these non-payroll costs. Uh, your your eight-week covered period will begin uh, when your loan is dispersed to you. So for many people who maybe have not applied, um, there is a newish tool that's available to you. I just like to point it out because it is a little helpful when you're trying to figure out how much would you be eligible for under this program. Um, the link is there, and this is just one example. There's a, a document that runs through how you calculate your loan amount based on your form of business and maybe the particular tax filings you might have. So the basic computation is the same, but where you're gonna derive your information from may change. We're basically looking at your 2019 payroll costs, all those things we just talked about lumped together. Um, if you weren't in business for all of 2019, that's okay. We'll use whatever portion of the year you were in business. Basically take that number, you're gonna divide by 12 to give your average monthly payroll costs, and then you're going to multiply that monthly number by 2.5 to get the overall amount that you will be eligible for under the PPP program. Um, because this is, we're in round two, and so obviously a lot of businesses were funded in round one, and even in round two, most of the money is being pushed out rather quickly. So people are now using the funds and they're asking about forgiveness. What does forgiveness look like? I wanna make sure I'm doing the right thing so that I can have my loan forgiven. Uh, we are still waiting for the really detailed guidance to come out about the forgiveness, but we do have you know, some basic instructions that are available to us in the existing rules and uh, FAQs. So we do know that as a borrower, you have the ability to request forgiveness from your lender you know, after your eight week period ends. Um, you have up until June 30th of next year, 2021. So you don't have to, you know, eight weeks in one day, you don't have to go right back to your bank to request forgiveness. You can, but you have a little bit of time. Um, the borrower or the lender, excuse me, is then going to request documentation from you to, to verify that you use the funds the way you were supposed to. Um, this will be, the lender will have some discretion, I believe, on how, what they might ask for. It's going to depend on your form of business. It's going to depend on what type of documentation you have. It might vary from business to business. Um, but just uh, know that while you're going through your eight-week period, um, a tip, I, if I were you, I would, you know, make sure I'm saving all of my materials, kind of archiving everything, putting it aside so that when you do go back to the lender to request forgiveness, you kind of got everything all pooled and ready to go. And you can be able to produce whatever documentation they want to ask you for. The lender then is going to communicate with SBA that yes, this borrower did, um, did meet the requirements for loan forgiveness, SBA forgive the loan. 
um, uh, any unused or unforgiven portion, I should say, um, is going to be then converted into a term loan under the conditions, the 1% interest, two-year term, six-month deferment. So as we can see, this is, um, there might have been one more update. Actually, I think there was on our website, but this is the latest um, data. And of round two, you can see that we are only around, you know, $188 billion, um, probably a little bit higher than that right now. Um, and you'll see that the average loan size is actually in this round about $73,000. So there's a lot of smaller transactions, a lot of smaller businesses, a lot of smaller banks. Look at the number of banks. We onboarded a lot of new lenders, uh, a lot of community-based lenders, credit unions, uh, and, and CDFIs and others. So the purpose of trying to create as many resources for the small business community to tap into as possible. And if you can tell by the data that those smaller banks have really um, jumped in to support their community and have been very active and, and aggressively trying to help their local small businesses. Again, funding still available. So if you have not yet applied and you would like to, there is still opportunity for you to do so. Um, I was going to show you the latest on the idle. This is the idle advance, uh, which is the t up to 10,000. I can't show you the whole country all state by state because otherwise you would never be able to read it. But this one does highlight California and California small businesses received the greatest number and the greatest dollar value of this particular program so far. And the same is true with the, um, the idle, um, the regular idle funds as well. Um, California small businesses are again receiving the greatest number and dollar value of those loans. Um, as we prepare to get some questions here, I just want to show people um, for the PPP program, there are a, there are a significant number of resources out there. Uh, because we, this is a new program and we are creating this as we go along, it's, it's kind of piecemeal as opposed to one nice SOP, unfortunately. But the stuff, it is updated, things are posted um, nearly daily. So there's lots of rules to read through. And actually there was another one that just came out that I didn't have a chance to add to this before this morning's presentation. But there's lots of resources to consult. Um, and those resources include not only SBA, but also our resource partners, like our SCORE, SBDC, Women Business Centers, and VBOC. All of our business advisors are ready and available to assist you, albeit we're all operating by phone and email these days. Um, our SBDC network in Northern California has actually created a financing team to help triage some of these issues for you, and you can call um, or email them for a one-off question or if you'd like to engage in a longer term um, dialogue and set up an actual appointment with one of the advisors. Um, so also have resources um, through our website, links to all the programs I just talked about. Um, and then I would just like to close before we go to questions with just a big thank you um, to our business advisors, uh, our lenders, our chambers, local government, and all of the resource partners out there and all the organizations who have really jumped in to help support the small business community. I mean, it's, everybody has been affected by this. And so it's really heartening to see the surge and the support around the small businesses in particular. And a big thank you. Um, can't thank everybody enough for all their efforts and trying to help us help you. and. Um, help you guys just survive and then hopefully move into recovery and thrive mode. So I will stop sharing. Great, thank you, Julie. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I have been monitoring the questions here and uh, we do have uh, some time for some questions. I wanna just get a couple things out of the way. Uh, yes, this is being recorded. And secondly, the slides, um, will be available, we'll check with all our presenters afterwards, but we will post them to our website. So thank you again, uh, Julie. Uh, like I say, you've probably been a little busy, so thank you for <laughs> taking the time to be with us. So uh, a couple of uh, questions that came up a number of times. What if I'm a sole proprietor? And there are a lot of those in our region. We're a region of small businesses, certainly 50 employees and under, and most likely 25 and under. And uh, so if I'm a sole proprietor, do, can I qualify for a PPP loan? Mm -hmm. 
Yes, any form of business can apply, a sole proprietor with or without employees. Um, because in this case, you're kind of considered your own employee. And so uh, a sole okay. proprietor, self-employed, even 1099 contractors can apply in their own right for this program. Okay, all right, very good. So it, even if I'm paying myself as the sole employee of, of the business, I'm, I'm able to apply. And then I hear you say there's, there's money still available. There is, there is. I mean, I think, um, um, this we had such a great demand and there was that rush in the in yes. the first week but there is still funding available so I um, I think a lot of businesses just thought oh it's gonna go so fast I'm not even gonna yes. be able to get in the queue but absolutely you can still apply and still receive funding so I encourage okay. people to do so <laughs> fantastic okay so uh, let's see what if I this is kind of a, a specific question but what if I add an employee during this time, uh, can that be part of my 75%? Is that, is that okay? Yeah, I mean, I'm encouraging people to try to talk to their lender about their unique situation. Because right now we have um, the guidance documents and more coming out on a daily basis. So um, the lender is, the, is the, an important partner in this, in this equation. So I definitely encourage people to talk to their lenders, make sure they understand what's going on with you and let them hopefully try to coach you through how to submit and what you can count. Actually, that was another of our question, which was uh, many banks are not, ex at least this questioner said, many banks are not accepting PPP loans at this point. Is there, uh, what, are, what are you hearing from our yeah. user? Um, you know, mixed mixed reviews. We do have on our, our district office website, so that's the sba.gov slash ca slash sf, a list of all the, the banks in the northern, that service Northern California small businesses that we're aware of that are participating. So I have found some banks, I mean, some banks may have exhausted their internal resources and maybe can't lend anymore. Other banks are actually opening it up and accepting even more applications um, but there, there are still a variety of different lenders out there. Uh, so you might want to take a look at the list if, you're, um, if your bank isn't offering PPP anymore for any reason. There, you, know, you can go to the, any lender that you would like. You're not locked into going just to your primary bank. Okay, again, that, that list is on the SBA website? Yes, on my district office site here for, uh, for San Francisco. Um, so sba.gov slash CA slash sf okay okay great so another question that that came in um a 501c6 which is a form of a nonprofit, i, I mm -hmm. guess uh, are they eligible or not um as of today they are not um i know that there has been a lot of um appeals made to our elected officials to have them included. So um, as of today, they are not, uh, but stay tuned, the legislation could change and that and they could be included, so. Okay, okay. And um, let me ask you this, where do you see this developing over the next two to three months? Do you think there will be more programs, more dollars available? It is, it is challenging to predict. Um, I think, I don't know that the PPP program, I don't know if they'll expand that in any capacity. Um, I do know that the um, HEROES Act is now being negotiated in, in Congress right now. Yeah. And I do believe the House is scheduled to vote on Friday. Um, I think there's more money uh, proposed, I should say, more money for the EIDL program. And I think there's a lot, they're looking at other um, in, uh, ways to fund. So whether it's infrastructure projects, other things to create more opportunities for some of the businesses to perform work and, and obviously then to rehire. I believe there's also proposals that would be outside of SBA, obviously, and, and more um, stimulus checks and infusions to individuals. So the SBA portion, I think, might slow a little bit, maybe some additional funding for EIDL, but then we'll have to look and see what our next, as we go into the next phase, as we all are dealing with, you know, phases two and three, and as we reopen, what kind of support can we, can we rally and what do we need to do to help support those businesses in those next phases? So it's all still part of the conversation. Well, I see, I see a question here. Um, uh, 
thank you for your time. Are there any networks or coalitions in North Bay businesses that can keep this recovery and, and growth going? This isn't specifically for you, but mm -hmm. just to answer that, all our chambers, the North Bay Leadership Council, Sonoma County Alliance, they're all, you know, 100% in to keep, and, and us at the Business Journal, keeping people connected um, to each other, even though, you know, we can't come across and shake hands. It's probably going to be a while for that. So, so Julie, anything you'd like to add for your audience here? So I would just say to, you know, the businesses out there, you know, you've, you've, you've been through a lot in North Bay in the last several years with wildfires and now yeah. a disaster a pandemic. And it's, it's been a challenge and, and um, I know it's scary and we don't know what the future holds, but I do encourage you to try to reach out to us and our resource partners because you don't have to necessarily go through it all, all alone. Let us try to help you. Um, let us try to, right help you get to the right resources, whether it's SBA or something else that's out there. So please connect with us and we really wanna to try to help you. Well, well, thank you very much. You know, I, you know, one of the things everyone can do is like they can go to the person that cuts their hair and you can pay them for a future haircut because it's all about cash flow right now. So, mm -hmm. or maybe you can commit to buying a product down the road, pay for it now. So how we can all uh, help each other, but thank you, Julie for being with us again. I know you're extremely busy and I hope we can keep contact. And if Julie says, okay, we'll put her slides up on our website uh, later today or tomorrow at the latest, okay? Please join me again in thanking, uh, thanking Julie, maybe give her a virtual wave So um, <laughs> and, and take care. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. So again, I wanna thank uh, Julie for being with us. And um, in our remaining half an hour, we have uh, a panel uh, to discuss the kind of state of the economy, uh, where we're going with tourism. I saw a story the other day that hotel occupancy, which I think bottomed out is something like 10% is starting to climb back up. And, uh, and then also, you know, a panelist here, Terry Hill from BPM, uh, to, to talk, talk about what he's seeing out there. So uh, with us today is uh, Dr. Rob Eiler, who's the Dean of the School of Extended Education at Sonoma State University. He's a professor of economics and well-known economic uh, observer uh, here on, in the North Bay. And then uh, I mentioned Terry Hill, who is uh, a partner in the advisory practice with, with BPM. And then finally, um, Todd O'Leary, who is the Marketing and Communications uh, Director, President, Vice President of Marketing and Communications for Sonoma County Tourism. And please uh, join me in thanking all of them for being here with us. The way this is going to go is we've worked on some questions uh, ahead of time. And, uh, but before we do that, I just wanna go around and have each of them talk a little bit about themselves and the, their organization. So Rob, I think I'm gonna start with you. Okay, uh, well, my name's Rob Eiler, and as Brad said, I'm the Dean of the School of Extended International Education at Sonoma State, and I'm an economist by trade otherwise. And so a lot of things I've been doing is just watching what's been going on, trying to answer questions when they come. Thank you, Rob. Thank you again for being with us, Terry. Hey, Brad, and, and thanks, thanks for having us. Um, so two things, B BPM is, a, is an accounting and advisory firm. We've got, uh, been around since eight, 1986, have eight offices in Northern California. Two of those are in the North Bay. And uh, I, I am a partner in the advisory group and, and really delighted to share what we've learned from talking to really hundreds of companies in the last uh, two months, which has been a really just extraordinary time, time period for all of us. Yeah. Well, thank you, Terry, again, for being with us. I think he's, you know, people are coming to us from uh, long distances. He's coming to us from Oakland. I think Julie, I don't know where Julie was, probably San Francisco. So, so Todd, how about you? Uh, tourism, you know, foundational industry for the North Bay, Sonoma County, Napa in particular. And we know there's, there's a lot of pain there, but, um, you know, like you said, you've been through fires and floods and everything else, and you're, you're taking this one on as well. 
We are. We're re definitely a resilient bunch, aren't we, up here in Sonoma County? Um, so again, as Brad mentioned, I'm Todd O'Leary. I'm the Vice President of Marketing and Communications at Sonoma County Tourism. Our organization represents um, over 3,000 tourism-facing businesses here in Sonoma County, um, and we promote the um, destination to consumers, to meeting planners, um, to tour operators and others who are looking to um, hopefully visit here in Sonoma County. So I'll be talking a little bit later about how we've been doing that through the pandemic and uh, what our plans are moving forward. Nice to be with Great. you. Well, thank you again to all of you for, for being with us. This is a, a bit like walking out on the diving board for us and and diving in, but it's uh, we didn't want to sit idly by and, and do nothing. So and this is way beyond doing nothing. So uh, we appreciate all of you being with us. So uh, I'm gonna ask each of the panelists to spend a, a little bit of time in their particular area. Let me just sort of the, the vision for the panel is where we're at now and then where we might be, you know, late summer into next year, because we all know this is going to, to, to take a while. And gra it's so gratifying to see gradually things starting to come back people going back to work, you talk, see businesses that are getting, they get a PPP loan, they bring their people back. And um, there are great stories of resilience out there and innovation, and, I, and we'll get to those in a minute. But first I wanna start with Dr. Eiler. Um, let's start with you to kind of give a review of the kind of the state of the North Bay, the state, maybe even the nation, and then where you see us see this going we've seen you know v-shaped recovery u-shaped recovery i saw swoosh the other day sure so everyone's trying to to visualize this so please welcome uh, dr rob eiler thanks brad i'm going to share my uh slideshow now hopefully you're going to see that brad just confirm that that's up we got it all right cool so folks, in the next little bit, I'm gonna to try to walk you through what's going on at the macroeconomic level and get us down to the North Bay. The data have not really come out yet about the North Bay, but we're gonna see in the next couple of weeks that those data are coming. So let's have a look now at some stuff very quickly. Uh, this situation has led to reactions and a tale of three policies. Two of them, which are positive, are monetary and fiscal policy. We see them in interest rates move back down to where we were right at the bottom of the Great Recession. We've seen an enormous fiscal policy package. Julie talked about some of that, uh, or part of that through SBA uh, before me. And we were trying to offset the social policy and having to be restricted to staying home or just having to not be able to go to work. And the hope is that the sum of those two positive policies outweigh the negative of the social policy. And only until we open up are we really gonna test that hypothesis in earnest. Uh, one of the pieces of data we've been watching very closely are new claims for uh, unemployment insurance. And so I'm gonna show you some data that are historic uh, with a glimmer of hope. Here's the last three recessions from 1986 forward, and this is the U.S. data, and you can see where the number of people who went in and asked for unemployment began to walk up, but it's so subtle against what's happened in the last six or seven weeks. This is the quarterly average weekly data that come out about these numbers, and you can see where they began in terms of each shaded area, but on the far right-hand side, you can see what's happened, and it spiked up in a quarterly average to over 22 million, but really, it's actually in excess of 33 million at this point. Here's California in contrast using the right-hand axis. Same basic thing, a little bit more uh, seasonality in the data, but the same basic dynamic. Now, one of the pieces of data, and I'm now gonna take it to the California level, we're watching over the next few months is gonna be continued claims for unemployment insurance. So once people go on unemployment, how long they stay on unemployment is as important. So here are the continued claims or the number of weeks that people stay in, on unemployment in the aggregate in a quarterly average. And here's the unemployment rate in California contrasted to that. Now, why is this important? Is because for economists, we're trying to grab onto any data available and try to predict the future. And you notice that the peak of the black line, which is continued claims for people staying on unemployment insurance happens before, at least in the last three recessions, the peak of unemployment. So once we see continued claims begin to peak, we can start to have some feeling that the unemployment rate is gonna be peaking relatively soon thereafter, and we will begin to slowly recover. I'll make that point later when I show you that blue line against the six counties of the North Bay and unemployment, historically speaking, in just a bit. GDP numbers came out for the first quarter of 2020, and this is what they look like. And over the last three recessions, this is from 1990 forward in a quarterly fashion, you'll see the first quarter of 2020 on the far right-hand side, negative 4.8%. The lowest movement in the 
Great Recession, which is the third shaded area as you're moving left to right, was negative 8.2. But that was after a couple of negative quarters and one barely positive quarter uh, in, in compounding way. We're just starting the pain. So one of the biggest things for economists to say, what data are available and what can we actually see coming forward? So this is about income and productivity, and there's been a shock, and this is just the first quarter. The second quarter is likely to be more ugly. I'll talk about that more in a minute. We did get some jobs data for the U.S., and instead of telling you, well, I'll tell you this, is that uh, the first estimate for April was 14.7% unemployment for the, for the country. It follows those uh, initial claims for unemployment insurance. But this is where the job loss is centered in terms of industry-level data for the U.S. You'll notice on the far right-hand side, four categories of jobs to think about. Durable manufacturing, retail services, an array of other services, which includes nonprofits, hair salons, nail salons, automotive shops, and then leisure and hospitality, which Todd is gonna to talk about more in a bit. Those are where the real contraction is taking place in jobs. Notice what that data by negative 47.2 means is that 47.2% of the people that were employed in April 2019 are no longer employed in April 2020. So it's been a real big hit in, that, in those industries which include hotels and restaurants. Um, and you can see, I'm sorry, and you can see January 2010, the last major problem month of the Great Recession in contrast to what happened in April. So this gives you a sense of the magnitude vis-a-vis -vis the, the ending parts of the Great Recession. Here are some forecasts. And so this is where you, all the data I just showed you kind of combine a, a way of thinking forward. So the National Association of Business Economists put out in April what they thought was going to happen. And there's median forecasts, the nastiest forecast, which is the lowest in terms of GDP, the highest in terms of unemployment rate, and then the highest in terms of GDP, the lowest in terms of unemployment rate, which is kind of the more optimistic look. Here's the next three quarters. And you can see that the five lowest, the most a uh, brutal forecast suggests we're going to actually have a contraction maybe of negative 50% of GDP in the second quarter. Right now, the way business activity is starting to pick back up again, we don't think we're going to get that high, but the median forecast is probably a little bit closer to the truth. Somewhere probably around the negative 30 round is where we'll end up, or the negative 30 area. But if you look at that with unemployment rates, with unemployment in April being 14.7, if it starts to climb a little toward that highest piece, we may drag a little longer. So the key is, I'll say in a second, it is a combination of both depth and duration. We wanna know how low we're gonna go and using policy to try to pick that back up and then try to keep unemployment from staying too high too long. One of the biggest questions I've had is about housing. Zillow has been very optimistic. They think California is gonna have a major boost in terms of housing prices this year. But Fannie and Freddie, who generally are relatively good bellwethers in, with respect to housing forecasts, think it's going to be kind of flat across the U.S. this year and maybe slightly in the next year because supply and demand might be walking hand in hand, both going down somewhat. Uh, but a lot of it depends on where you live. So if you look at the Zillow forecast, a lot of it is moved toward rural California getting the most growth. And so we'll see how that plays out if people leave the cities and move to some other place because they can from telecommuting or they want to because they don't want to be in the urban area anymore. Here's average hours worked. Another piece of data to watch is where average hours are slipping. So this is the percentage change from the previous year over the U.S. overall. And you can see on the far left-hand side that dip is the Great Recession time. So we'll see on the far right-hand side, on the very far right-hand side, uh, where we've seen some drops. So this is construction hours per week. And there's been about just, un just under 4% drop. That's manufacturing dropping a little bit more significantly. Retail hasn't changed much because we've sort of shifted the way we're retailing. We've seen some retailers actually boost the amount of hours and the number of workers and other ones have to close completely. Professional services is pretty much maintained right at the U.S. average. Information, so if you think about this as coding, publishing, and sort of the array of tech jobs out there, that's actually picked up because a lot of those jobs are portable. And then finally, this is leisure and hospitality. Now, the glimmer of hope here that connects back to the un initial uh, unemployment insurance claims is that we've actually seen this pick back up. So we may have started to slowly turn the corner on restaurants and hotels. Brad alluded to this in terms of the occupancy rate starting to pick up and Todd's probably going to talk about this at length in a minute. But that's something to watch to see whether that continues to pick up. The combination of all these data will help us tell when the corner is going to get turned. And there's the U.S. again. So like I said earlier, folks, this is an issue of depth and duration and policies trying to shrink both of those in such a way that once we open up, we turn the corner more quickly. 
What we're trying to do is avoid a loss of capacity. So from an economic standpoint, we'd want, we know job losses are happening. We don't want them to convert to business losses and we don't want them both to start working off of each other because we know job losses happen as a first reaction. We know business losses will come from that in terms of having a lower level of demand and ultimately just not being able to stay in business. But when they start to work together, the capacity of the economy is affected because both sides of the market sag simultaneously. Here's that unemployment rate uh, comparison I talked about earlier. Here's California. These are the data I showed you before, but just from 2000 forward. So I'm going to try to do this relatively slowly so you can watch. I did this for all six counties to kind of give a sense of how historically each county moves with the California average. You're going to see most of them, except for Marin, move pretty much in sync. There's Sonoma County. And you can see on the far right-hand side where we just saw the March kick up. The April numbers come out on May 22, and that's going to tell a tale, and I'll conclude with that in just a second. There's Napa. There's Marin. And you can see the peak of Marin generally happens before the peak in Marin or in uh, California, that's true of both those recessions that are shown in this data. This is Lake County, that's Mendocino County, and that's Solano County, where Mendocino and Solano tend to move right along the average of the state. So at the end of the day, folks, how the California economy goes, and when we hear predictions about California, that generally is how the North Bay counties go. Marin, a little bit faster uh, recovery period, but not much. Okay. So what are the expectations here? You should expect Marin County to have less, un less un unemployment problem than other places, but 148,000 people in the last two months have asked for unemployment insurance in these six counties. Okay, so you're talking about a significant percentage of the workforce somewhere in the high teens. So we should expect unemployment rates to be at in the high teens or in the mid teens for sure. And it's because we have a relatively large amount of exposure to those industries that were hurt. Housing markets are probably going to remain relatively stable. Once we turn the corner, whether lower interest rates help support that or not will be answered. And then finally, what to watch, as I said earlier, May 22 is a big day. We're going to get the April numbers at the county level and at the state level, and it's going to start telling the tale of the depth. And then we'll see if policy can shrink the duration. But there are some opportunities. And since when we go back to work, we should see some innovations, and hopefully that will spring up some new businesses the caseload is what's gonna ultimately dictate us coming out of this and staying out of this. One of the biggest problems is a repeat. So watch for that. And then that cost benefit analysis of how we open is going to help us recover. So Brad, thank you again for having me and hopefully that was informative. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you again for being with us. And I know Rob has to uh, get to a important meeting. Uh, there's nothing going on in the CSU system. So I don't know what meeting he's going to. Can but uh, we can take questions for Rob. Um, again, I would, uh, hey Rob, if you had to give this recovery uh, a shape, I know that's kind of silly in a way, but what would it look like? Uh, that's a great question. So just like with the Great Recession, economists get a lot of questions about the alphabet soup possibilities. Right now it looks like a modified V in the sense that if everything goes right and policy works correctly, it should not be a V where it bounces down and bounces right back up, It probably bounce down and then a slight, let's say, movement of, to an obtuse angle of the, of the right-hand leg of the V and then start moving up in recovery. The key from being a modified V to a U-shaped recovery is whether or not we repeat, and the repeat ends up with the same social policies we had in this round. If that happens again, we might double dip, and thus it'll flatten the depth and then extend the duration. And that's why that, that's the policy came together so quickly is to yes. try to avoid that exact outcome. So uh, that kind of begs the question. So I was in a, in a webinar a few weeks ago, actually, and it was hospital experts, and they were talking about a surge, and I was, I was stunned. I was like, well, we're flattening out, what have you. There's still that risk, apparently, or at least there's the preparations for the worst case and hoping for the best. So if you, as a, an economist, had, uh, you know, sort of opinion about how things should go, what would be best for the economy in terms of reopening the economy, what would that be? You got to reopen the economy in ways where the businesses can easily flex into the situation, but you also have to trust the idea that they're going to adapt and innovate relatively quickly. So one of the concerning pieces is if we don't allow people to move around, especially in California, we will lose an entire tourism year and if that happens, it's going to be very right. problematic because there's all kinds of economic impact connections from those industries into the other parts of the economy. And that's something that everybody's got to realize is that 
when you open up one part of the economy, it does affect others, which is great. But if you don't recognize those connections, you might open up parts of the economy that don't have broader impacts. But the game is this sort of, you know, health, the health concerns against the economic concerns. And we're still in that part of the matrix, you know, for better, or for worse. So the best thing to do is to recognize where your strengths are and to make sure that those businesses feel like that they can adapt and innovate well enough to minimize the potential risk to the healthcare system and then slowly allow the economy to open up and get back at least to some proportion of its full capacity. That's the game right now because the policies we've passed, the lower interest rates and all the fiscal packages really don't have their effects until we open the economy up in, in a broad way. So, so how do you see this? You know, I, people talk to me and say, well, we can probably hold a live event at the end of the year. And I always say, well, you probably could, but would anyone come? So, so how do you, uh, you know, how do you encourage people to start going back out in a way that is, that is safe and, and prudent and supports the economy? Well, unfortunately, right now, a lot of that's a public health question and not a question for economic development. We have to wait to get some clearance and we can't gather, then events will not get permitted to allow for a certain amount of people to gather anyway. But assuming that that slowly happens, I think the idea of the fear piece, or let's say the consumer confidence piece in gathering, will be how those businesses innovate and adapt to the new situation in such a way where the safety concerns are minimized and the ability to enjoy the event a la the, let's say the old times or what was the old normal uh, needs to be in place. I think you're going to see some entrepreneurism around that in such a way that actually new businesses will spring up to provide those kind of services. Hmm. It'd be intriguing to watch how that evolves over the next six to eight months once we open back up to try to help people gather. Because I think human beings, you know, generally, you know, innately want to get together uh, and, and come to things like concerts and, and other festivals. And I think that there's going to be some want to do that such that entrepreneurism will come in and solve some of those problems. We'll see. But on the front end, there's going to definitely be some fear that needs to be eclipsed. So do you see any potential growth areas or what industries do you see doing well? It was interesting to see maybe the, the rural real estate markets would do a little better than urban. Yeah, I think you'll see rural real, real estate markets do well. I think you'll see... Uh, broadband services that expand into light suburban and rural areas do well because there'll be some push and potentially federal and state money over time that will want to get everybody connected so that there are more, there are more business options and more connectivity if this comes back. I think you will see new businesses around healthcare manufacturing and healthcare services that will provide solutions for businesses. Those will be the big three coming out. Construction and manufacturing as parts of that will probably have some some growth, uh, but personal services, restaurants, retail are probably going to have a much slower emergence because they'll have a higher cost of going back into business and also potentially having some sag in consumer confidence on the retail side. So that's where, that's where we're kind of gravitating toward in terms of what we think is the growth phase, but we don't have any idea yet uh, how many businesses have been lost to know the capacity of the economy just yet. Great. Well, Rob, again, thank you for being with us. I know you have- uh, Yeah, I'm sorry I have to leave to get to and uh, thank you again for being with us and we'll have your slides available on our website uh, if you give us the okay and thank you again for for being with us this morning appreciate it very much thanks a lot brad thanks for having me and thanks for the flexibility okay take care so thank you to rob and uh, now i'd like to turn to uh, to terry hill who's our next uh, our next speaker Terry, again, is a partner in the advisory practice with, with BPM. He's uh, literally been on the ground with hundreds of businesses during this incredible period uh, that we're in. Uh, Terry has a background as an entrepreneur. And please welcome uh, Terry Hill uh, from BPM. Terry, over to you. Hi, Brad. Thanks. And, and I am having some tech issues. Are you hearing and seeing me okay? We're hearing and seeing you. Okay, good. I can't see you, but I'm, I'm going to do this the old fashioned way. Okay. Um, thank you so much. And, and we have, we, we have the, the last two months has been really, really extraordinary. And, it, and it, you know, we, we've talked to hundreds and hundreds of, of direct clients and then our, our near field business community, uh, sometimes pro bono. Uh, our, our North Bay offices um, have uh, lots of clients in lots of sectors. That includes food and wine, uh, craft brew, consumer and industrial, um, food, uh, business services and technology, and among others. And they've all really had a very different experience. Um, 
And so we're, we're, we've been tracking three sort of different themes that I, I think kind of align with, with the experience each company is having and will have through the sort of next 90, 60, uh, 180, 360 days. Um, and those are, are the following. So one, of course, is the SBA program with the PPP. We've been helping uh, through the loan application process itself, as well as uh, what many people are in now, which is the forgiveness period. And we'll talk about that for a minute. Uh, the second is emergence. Um, and this is just a simple concept of how do you equip the business and the people in your business with the tools to see, um, see where, you can, where you can pull and push levers to make the business go. And some of that is just survival, right? We've, we've had a, a bit of shock and awe and, and people are trying to understand what it all means. But we'll talk about the concept of emergence. And then the last one is, um, is what we call harvest strategy. I think the, co the COVID pandemic and, and its effect on business has, has really had us talking to folks uh, a lot more about, well, what was your strategy before and how do you as a business get back to some modicum of normalcy? Um, so in that order, let me just really quickly, and, and I'll, I'll do a quick sidebar, which is, um, you know, our firm provides tax and assurance and advisory services, and we've been focused certainly on, on the functional bits and bytes of that with these client conversations. But this is really a, this is really a, a conversation about people, right? Um, employers just really love their people. They want to understand how this, how this affects people and people going on leave, being furloughed. Um, how can they bring, bring people back with the PPP and other, other grant programs? Um, so just, it's just really struck us emotionally as well about um, how close this brings us all to the people in these businesses. On the PPP program, I think we've covered most of the, uh, of the mechanics of it. Um, from a forgiveness perspective, it really, really is critical that companies have all of the pieces of material to tell their story. Some of that's really the obvious stuff. You'll probably already have it already. That's payroll documentation, you know, rent and utility documentation, where the money went, right? Um, there are some calculations that are pretty easy to go find. We won't cover that too much. But if you have Microsoft Teams or Yammer or some other kind of collaborative platform, you may very well just put a, ha a half a dozen or so people that are, that are in the line of this data flow and tracking these documents and just be able to put all your documents in one place and have folks be able to dialogue in sort of a specific way um, for the period you're, you're going through forgiveness. Uh, that I hope will give rise to um, some of the storytelling, right? We've had some conversations about people that haven't had a, uh, a visible or obvious revenue collapse or adverse effect shown in the revenue. However, they have had some very interesting uh, and severe working capital hits, and they've had some threat to their other working, working uh, credit lines. So we're still waiting for some of the guidance, but I think some of the storytelling in this eight week period will have to do with things that aren't just revenue as well as the payroll record keeping. So keep everything you can about um, backing up the story around how you've been affected, one-time extraordinary expenses that might include PPE, or um, you know, hiring special consultants to get through a, the performance obligation for a client if you're a business services company. Um, so there are all kinds of things that are gonna affect people very, very differently. And um, it's just good to start with keeping all of your records in one place. You, you gotta start there and then be, a, be ready to tell your story. The other thing I'm gonna recommend is, is, is stay very, very close to your bank. I think we talked a little bit about the fact that there's still some money out there I think people on the phone that have done anything to try and apply for the PPP probably have recognized that the, um, the experience they have with their bank <clears throat> could very well be very, very different to another person's experience with another bank. So try and understand what your bank is doing, how they're looking at the forgiveness period and what's gonna happen um, in the process. You're probably getting some notices, but the guidance for all of the, the, the ins and outs of the forgiveness haven't fully been written. And I'll add to Julie's comment, it really is um, building the plane while you fly it. But unfortunately, I think the runway is moving around a bit as well. So it's been, it really has been a very tricky affair for, for everyone. The banks obviously are looking at their credit risk. So they're starting to shut down lending as well. So, so please, please stay very close to your bank so you're not surprised by, um, by both the forgiveness and then just what happens to the rest of your liquidity requirements. So, so theme number two is this concept of emergence. 
And what I'm hoping will happen for companies and what we're trying to encourage the folks we're talking to is that while you're collecting all of this data to tell your story, which is pretty simple, right? You've got some payroll records and some one-time extraordinary expense records. Let's start to really look at how this has affected your business, um, what that has done to your working capital and what your cash position is certainly now, but most important, June, July, August, fourth quarter, first and second quarter, right? And for folks that have had a real hit, right? Um, what does your recovery look like? When will your customers come back? Are there product lines actually that have now taken off that maybe have been 20% of the business now or 50 because they're e-commerce based or there's a new service line or you're a healthcare provider and now you've had telehealth really kick off. So you need to understand that. And more importantly, you need to understand what that's going to do to the cash side of your balance sheet. You have to have a, a very clear understanding. There's a, there's a number of ways to do that. But, um, you know, whether you're just going to put in place a very simple cash forecast or put a more robust rolling, what's called a rolling 13 cash forecast in, um, you really need to not, um, not get surprised in the summertime. That's, that's our sort of first layer of advice. Um, so the last piece is this concept of, of your harvest strategy, right? So every company, whether you're a, a venture backed business, whether you've got some partners, whether you are a sole, you know, a uh, principally held business with a single member and you've got a hundred employees and you, you may have uh, a lot of personal wealth concentration in the business. Um, it's really, really critical. And if I kind of take all of this in order from the PPP loan forgiveness to telling your story, to understanding your cash position, to understand number one, are you going to, are you going to make it through this? I, I fear that some folks just won't. Um, number two, uh, what will your recovery look like and what are the cash demands of the business going to be? There are, uh, in many cases, a fair amount of interplay be between the, the personal and the business. So understanding your, your, uh, your wealth strategy. If you have a wealth advisor who has some, some fairly sophisticated approaches to, to, uh, to your, your, your trusts and to your tax strategies, there's, uh, there's often some interplay between the person and the business. Um, if you are someone who may have been in the business 40 years up until today, and you thought you had a few years left in you, and this is all sort of knocked the wind out of your sails, uh, there are some interesting opportunities with uh, doing some manner of, of growth financing, alternative financing, um, actually doing M&A and selling the business, potentially rolling over some of your equity. Um, in fact, there's a, it's a historic time. There's, a, there's $2 trillion plus of, of what's called investable dry powder in several different mechanisms in the private capital market. So if that is indeed your situation, uh, there are a tremendous number of opportunities that hadn't really existed before there if you're prepared. All of this is about preparedness. If you are not gonna make it, and some, and some companies won't, and this is why the cash forecasting is so critical, you need to understand that very early on so that you have options, right? If we're gonna talk about a harvest strategy which takes some wealth capacity in the business and transfers it back into the personal side of, of the, uh, of the trust or the, the ownership. Um, there are, there are some new ways to reorganize the business and, and protect yourself from liability from the business. You want to get out in front of that. So whether you are just installing the first makings of cash flow forecasting to understand what happens beyond the SBA to, um, understanding your customers and vendors to understanding, what really is going to happen to the business, not just in the summer, but 2021, 2022, and, and where you may need capital. Um, you need to do that quickly and you need to try to understand some of the basic, uh, basic uh, parameters around what that recovery looks like. So you have options, right? Those may be growth financing, alternative financing. Those may be some sale of the business if, if, it, if it's appropriate, where you can deconcentrate your personal risk and wealth in the business. That doesn't mean walking away. That can often mean a two bite at the apple situation, which can be actually quite favorable, both, uh, both economically and, and personally. Um, and sometimes you need to wind down the business and doing that thoughtfully uh, can indeed result in some sort of transference of wealth from the business to the personal. So, um, and I do think we're gonna see some, some innovation. We can get to this a little bit later, but I, we, we've already started to see some fun stories about people reigniting plans for sort of dormant product lines or services. We've seen people um, really get to know their, their employees better, which has been kind of fun to watch. And we'll, we've seen um, a, a real impetus behind cloud tools and connectivity and doing things that may have been on the shelf. So 
I think it's going to be a really interesting time. It won't be easy, but I think if people uh, get visibility and confidence in what their business is doing and how it's been affected, that's a great starting point. Great. Thank you so much, Terry. Uh, I think this question was intended for Rob. I'm just going to interject a question here, Todd, before we get to you. Uh, but I'm, but I'm hoping you're willing to at least take a stab at it. And that is, how do you see the the wine industry? And I know you're close, and BPM's very close to the wine industry evolving through this process. Is there anything you want to say about that, or, or? I certainly can, and I'm not uh, I'm not a wine expert myself, but um, and we have those in the firm. I think there's a couple of things. One, we're certainly going to see for for the companies that have D to C businesses, we've seen an immediate pickup there. Maybe the wholesale yes. side of the business has yeah. suffered, but the D to C, I, I certainly know that my personal consumption has has become <laughs> elevated during the period. So I know others are the same. Um, so the D to C businesses are doing well if you're so equipped. I think we'll probably see some partnerships kick off, distribution, sort of different ways of distributing or doing labeling um, and, and sort of joint venturing will, will be fun to watch. I think the wholesale will really come down to, of course, uh, the stores and how they're, um, the store, not, the, not the stores, but the restaurants and how they're, they're seeing the, the emergence themselves and, um, and how they're, they're able to distance and what the, you know, sort of what the recovery and, and just retail restaurant consumption is going to look like. That's going to be a longer tail, right? But right. Um, we're seeing innovation Great. in the wine space as well. Great. Well, once again, uh, thank you so much for being with us, Terry. So now, Todd, I'm going to, uh, to turn to you. Todd, as I, as I mentioned earlier, is the Vice President of Marketing and, and Communications for Sonoma County Tourism. He's charged with developing promotional strategies that drive awareness and visitation to Sonoma County. And again, he's responsible for marketing and his team, communications, media relations, et cetera. He's a 22-year veteran of the tourism industry, so he's got he's got a, 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 at least a major recession in his in his resume, and and fires and what have you, and and now this. And um, again, please welcome uh, Todd O'Leary. Thanks for being with us. Thanks, Brad. I appreciate that. And uh, let me share my screen. I have a few um, slides to share with all of you. Can all of you see that well? Brad, are you able to see that? Yes, we're able to see it. Okay, yes, thank great. You, Just want to make sure. Um, so again, um, kind of interesting um, what a tourism marketing organization is doing during a, a pandemic when travel as we used to know it is not happening. Um, so, but I am here to tell you we have been actually busier than ever in really trying to support our local um, businesses. As I mentioned, we uh, represent about 3,000 tourism facing businesses here in Sonoma County. And so it's been really, um, that's always a big part of what we do in taking care of those businesses. and and not now more than ever as it really becomes a, a true survival kind of story. Um, so just quickly about kind of what we've been doing since mid-March um, in the way of um, our activities at Sonoma County Tourism. We did have a spring campaign running, um, started in February. We paused that and really all of our outbound tourism sales and marketing programs. So um, those were have all been paused. Um, you know, during this time, we've really been showcasing those virtual experiences. We've all seen that on social media. Perhaps you've, you've participated in some of those yourself, whether that's a, a virtual wine tasting, virtual yoga, um, you know, uh, I'll talk about the dreaming phase of travel and, and, and that really is a, a lot of uh, what we all have been kind of um, participating in for the last nine weeks. Um, as always, we're sharing beautiful Sonoma County imagery. We want to stay top of mind in the uh, minds of our, our traveling public and those who might come back here to Sonoma County once the shelter in place um, restrictions start to lift. Again, certainly engaging with uh, a lot of our tourism facing businesses, obviously as part of that to the elected officials and, and the tourism industry officials, kind of our counterparts within the different tourism industry segments. Um, that is certainly um, across the board with all of our staff and our board and committee members. Um, and uh, very, you know, a day by day kind of um, 
you know, activity while we're all just trying to stay um, abreast of the very quickly, rapidly changing um, dynamics of this very fluid situation. As I mentioned, really supporting those local businesses who are still operating. I have a slide about that in a second. Um, and then last week was actually National and National Travel and Tourism Week. Um, that's a, a, a a countrywide um, celebration. Actually, May is National Travel and Tourism Month, technically. Um, and so we did a lot of messaging, especially last week, um, about um, our efforts and about our really resilient um, industry here in Sonoma County. As I mentioned, when we've been really supporting our, our local businesses who continue to operate even in limited fashion during this time. So on the restaurant side of the business, we've all probably supported our local restaurants um, in the way of you know, those that are offering that delivery, curbside pickup, takeout kind of services. Um, so we maintain a list of those businesses in Sonoma County that are providing those services. We have a, actually have a map that um, users can interact with as well, depending on where you are in the region. Um, and then we produce signs for the restaurant. So you see an example of the sign that we produce there in the window of El Coqui in downtown Santa Rosa. Um, you, you'll, if you kind of are traveling about in your neighborhood, you'll probably see these businesses, um, especially the restaurant businesses, um, featuring these signs and what level of services they're offering during this period. Um, similarly, in the beverage industry, again, we, um, <laughs> Terry talked about supporting the wine industry. Um, we're, we're for better or for worse, we're drinking a lot more probably in, um, in, uh, during shelter in place than we were before. And um, that D to C businesses, um, we're trying to really, can, you know, really support that. So similarly to the, what we're doing with the restaurants, we're maintaining a list of the wineries, the breweries, the cideries, and so forth that are, again, offering those types of um, services um, such as uh, curbside pickup and, and so forth. Um, we're good partners, great partners um, with the Sonoma County Vintners and they have a sip from home program. So obviously this kind of dovetails with what we're um, talking about too and supporting that beverage industry um, here at Sonoma County Tourism. We did produce um, a couple of videos, one of which I'll show to you um, in a, in a, at the end of my presentation. But the first one, which I am not gonna show to you today, but it is posted on our YouTube channel, is In This Together. And we keep hearing this sentiment um, you know, out there in it, throughout the world, really. Um, we're all in this together. And, and so we did create uh, a video message to that end that really features um, the business community, um, elected officials and, and others throughout Sonoma County kind of expressing this, this message of um, solidarity um, and togetherness. So we have been distributing that online and obviously via our social channels. Again, it is posted on our YouTube channel. So I encourage you um, as businesses to check that out and perhaps leverage it in your own messaging. So talking about the theme of the conference is recovery. So how do we see the road to recovery? So as I mentioned before, Sonoma County Tourism has really been supporting um, this dreaming phase of travel. If you follow travel brands um, on your social channels or other ways, um, they're all operating in this way. So we all recognize we can't travel now, but that doesn't mean we're not thinking about that first trip that we're gonna take once shelter in place ends. And that is very much what we've been doing in our messaging. Um, so we want to, again, be the top um, consideration set for places to visit once these restrictions ease, and I'll talk about um, how we're approaching that in, in, a, in a moment. It really is going to be a phased approach, as um, you know, um, Rob talked about there, we, we're not quite sure what exactly what form the, um, you know, uh, economic recovery is going to take. And so too, with a, a marketing plan in a pandemic like this, um, we need to take a, a, a metered and phased approach. So really, um, that starts with our locals, we have to make sure that our locals are comfortable in, in moving about the county and the region uh, once shelter in place starts to lift. Um, so we're, you know, maintain a, a pretty close, um, you know, conversation with our locals and obviously our businesses and so forth, 
that's that's one of the things that is going to be important. I, I, I live in Santa Rosa. Um, I, I At this point, I feel like a trip to Healdsburg or Petaluma is going to be a vacation for me. So, um, I, you know, the, the same kind of mindset, I think, is where we need to f- really start. Um, and then obviously, as, as uh, time goes on, we'll expand that. Um, like most destinations, we're really going to be focused on the drive market um, to, to really drive that um, overnight visitation. Um, eventually, nonstop flight markets. Um, we'll we'll get to that point when when the time is right and when we start to see restrictions ease from other parts of the country. Um, that you know, as that makes sense. But really, for the time being, um, or you know, when when we start outbound marketing again, it really will be that drive market that will be key, I think, to our um, recovery. So really three pillars for our recovery strategy. Um, so again, as I, I talked about our residents, we are, wanna make sure that we're taking care of our residents and our local businesses, um, and then obviously visitors. So we're, we're really taking a, a very strategic um, long view um, at um, all three of those type or different um, groups of, of folks um, and making sure that we're um, uh, appropriately messaging and communicating with those folks as, as we move through the um, this uh, timeline here. Again, working with those different industry segments, whether it's the wine industry, the hotel and lodging industry, um, the transportation industry, and so forth, um, to really understand and convey these safety protocols that we're starting to see come out. Um, I know the EDB just uh, recently launched their SoCo launch initiative. Um, that's something that you know our team has been involved in, in helping to craft and being a part of that conversation. Um, we received recently some guidance from the um, California Hotel and Lodging Association that um, it helps provide a framework um, for the hotel and lodging industry to, to reopen. So we're looking at that. Similarly with the Wine um, Institute, the California Wine Institute um, uh, has, has put some of these things out for the wine industry. Um, so we're really, again, trying to understand these things as they come along. Um, and then again, uh, we'll, that'll be part of our marketing messages, obviously, because first and foremost, people will want to make sure that not only that they can travel, but they can travel safely and, and have a safe experience in coming here to Sonoma County. So then we've been really, even um, since the first week of shelter in place, we've already been planning um, our our messaging, our reopening messaging, if you will, to welcome visitors back to Sonoma County when the time is right. So certainly monitoring the news, again, having those discussions with the elected officials on how we do that in a safe way, um, but in a way that takes care of our businesses so that we mitigate the the damages um, economically from, from all of this. Finally, um, this is a, a video, uh, the, the other video I referenced earlier. Um, it's a video that we just released last week during National Travel and Tourism Week. I spoke before about the In This Together video. That r- was really intended to be more of a Sonoma County-centric kind of message. This video that I'm going to show you here and how I'm going to end my uh, presentation today is really looking at um, a kind of it's continuing this conversation um, with the consumer market. So you'll, you'll see how that turned out. So hopefully the, um, the sound and the video work well here. So here we go. Hey, Todd, we're not getting sound. Okay. Okay. Um, Well, um, I can, when I'm going to share out um, my deck uh, with all of you um, via the, the business journal. So I'll be sure to include the link to, again, both of those videos that I referenced um, in, um, in my presentation with all of you so you can see that. Again, it's also posted on our, our YouTube channel. So sorry about the, the audio issues, folks. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a button. But anyway, Todd, thank you so much for being with us. I, I got a question here, which I think you can answer right away. So I think you showed a a sign there that out in front of a restaurant for Mm -hmm. takeout and what have you. Mm -hmm. And this person wants to know, how do I get a sign if they're, if they're available? That one, yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. We're um, happy to provide that out to you. We've been uh, leveraging primarily the um, the chambers of commerce throughout the um, county to um, to help distribute those. But if um, if someone wants to uh, just contact me directly um, via email, I'm happy to um, to either mail or deliver one of those um, signs out to you. My email is t o l e a r y at sonomacounty.com. Okay. All right, great. And uh, thanks again, Todd, so much for, for being with us this morning. Um, uh, we're we're going to go to some questions. Perhaps during the time I, I'm, I, uh, Terry's talking, you can look for that audio button on your video, and we can give it a try uh, for count. Before, we, before we close out here today. So, so thank you again, um, uh, Todd. So, the next questions are kind of more philosophical as we kind of try to close out here on a, you know, kind of thoughtful way. And I, I want to turn to, to Terry and uh, start with him. Can you share us a story of resilience or innovation in this crisis that you've, that you've seen out there in all the businesses and the communities that you, uh, that you deal with? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, we, we, have a, we have a customer in the behavioral health space. They do some really interesting and important uh, work with, with children who were sort of ages two and a half to six to eight. And um, they were socked in the gut almost immediately. So when the shelter in place happened, revenues went down about 80%. And so they immediately had to, and these are uh, two talented clinicians who would rather sell their homes than let people go they terminated about a hundred people um, in the first 10 days of the pandemic because they just had to, to save the business. Uh, they are now back to about 80% capacity. And much of that has been done through uh, telehealth. And in fact, within about six days after the shelter in place, some of the payers, the people that actually have contracts with folks like this providing care, were able to put rapidly in place new codes, new bill codes, literally new bill codes to allow for these clinicians to charge telehealth codes through through their uh, through their contracts, um, so not only were they able to um, bring people back, which was kind of the whole purpose of the PPP and some of this resiliency uh, tool setting given by the SBA and the government, but they uh, they really have sort of given birth to uh, a whole new service line that was only about three percent of their business historically. So it's been really exciting to watch, not only the the folks that would write the uh, the sort of uh, co uh, codes, the CPT codes that would enable them to get paid on their contracts for this telehealth, but uh, serving these great great clients and uh, allowing them to bring people back and have like very likely a much uh, quicker recovery themselves than otherwise would have been possible. Not for not for the telehealth enablement. So very very cool story. Great. Great, thank you so much. That is a, a really nice story. So Todd, how about you, a, a story of resilience or innovation that you've seen out there? Yeah, definitely. We've certainly seen a lot of that in our industry. Again, um, you know, really a resilient bunch here in Sonoma County, as you talked about all the things that we've been through. Um, this obviously takes the cake um, in terms of how businesses figure their way through this. Um, you know, one of the things that I love, I'm mean, obviously Sonoma County is very well known for our, our, our food and wine scene. And so we're seeing um, businesses like wineries um, still be able to conduct a wine tasting. Obviously that's done virtually. Um, and in some cases there, these wineries are partnering with, you know, a cheese manufacturer or cheese producer of some sort um, to do, a, you know, cheese and wine pairing, obviously. So they're sending out, you know, little samples of, you know, you know, tastings of the different wines and then the cheeses go out, they're mailed to these consumers. And then, you know, there's a, a video that accompanies that and, you know, allows the the consumer to to still kind of have that quintessential Sonoma County experience and a cheese and wine pairing, um, but from the the comfort of their own home. So I think that's great. Um, just something that I, I think is really wonderful in terms of again not only you know, taking care of their individual businesses in this way and being able to have these kinds of products and services out there. But from somebody from a tourism marketing standpoint, that helps keep Sonoma County's brand top of mind too. So hopefully once again, shelter in place lifts, 
these folks will be like, oh, I really just want to go to that winery that I had that virtual tasting experience. I want to see that cheese, you know, monger, um, you know, and, and visit their farm and so forth. So it, it really is a really wonderful symbiotic relationship that helps us um, as an industry, really. So actually, Todd, in our, our calls preparing for this, uh, I shared that maybe there's a competitive advantage in our region for small group gatherings, you know, at a winery, 25 people or something like that for a winemaker dinner that we actually may have competitive advantage over, uh, you know, taking a cruise or going to a large uh, event. So um, uh, maybe, maybe we're positioned very well as things start to start to reopen. You're not quite ready to go uh, to a, to a, to an athletic you know, field or something like that, but you'd be willing to go to a 25 person winemaker dinner or something like that, so. Yeah, it's so. true. We, we think that we're you know, well positioned to, um, to you know, welcome visitors back here um, because we are more of a rural setting um, where I think unfortunately, I, you know, some of the more urban areas are going to struggle um, in the way of, you know, retaining, you know, that, that convention and meeting business, for instance. I mean, I've been following San Francisco and our friends down there, unfortunately, they're seeing cancellation after cancellation um, at Moscone Center and other hotels. And um, we don't obviously don't have that element of big convention and meeting business up here. But, um, you know, from a rural standpoint, from a, you know, a smaller gathering standpoint, I, I, I think we'll fare better, hopefully, anyhow, than, than other destinations. Great. Great. So uh, I understand from our te technical staff that we're, we can play your videos. So oh, um, why don't we go ahead and do that? It'll just be happening in the background. Might just take a second for them to, to get it going. For generations, Sonoma County has been the beautiful backdrop for countless celebratory toasts. A stunning yet down-to-earth place where travelers and locals alike find inspiration to commemorate all of life's moments. Through it all is the human spirit of connection, connecting with one another while connecting with a special place where you're always welcome. Despite the obstacles to physical connection that we experience today, we're still together, just in spirit. That spirit is alive and well. We know we'll see each other again in this beautiful place. But until then, we raise a glass of Sonoma County's finest. We toast you. We toast each other. Cheers. From Bricolor Vineyards, we raise a glass to you virtually and look forward to toasting you here in the future. We're all in this together. Hasta pronto, amigos. Salud. We raise a glass to you virtually and look forward to toasting with you in the Chen Chen, we raise a glass to you virtually and look forward to toasting together with you in the future. So cheers, come by, see you soon. We raise this cup of tea to you virtually today and hope to see you here lively and drink tea together. Arriba, abajo, al centro, adentro. Salud. We raise our glasses to you virtually and look forward to seeing you soon. Cheers. Cheers. We raise a glass virtually today and look forward to toasting with you in the future. For more of us at SpiritWorks. Cheers. <laughs> we raise a glass to you virtually and look forward to toasting with you together again in the future. Cheers, California. No matter your home, your language, your customs, we invite you to raise a glass. From Philadelphia, good luck. Dale. Can't wait to visit Sonoma County soon. From San Francisco, California, cheers. From Menominee Falls, Wisconsin, cheers. From Perth, Australia, cheers. cheers. From the Mile High City of Denver, Colorado, cheers. cheers. From Los Angeles, California, cheers. I raise my glass from Paris, France, and wish you all the best, and see you very soon in Sonoma County. Cheers from Bologna, a city where you can have a lot of good food and good wine as well, just like yours. So, hopefully, we gather together 
very, very soon for a very good toast. Cheers. From Milwaukee. Cheers. Cheers. Greetings from Lake Norman, located in Cornelius, North Carolina. We're all in this together. Cheers. Yeah, aloha from Hawaii. Sonoma, I miss you. Cheers from Berkeley, and see you again soon. From San Diego, cheers. From Petaluma in Sonoma County, California, cheers. From Dusseldorf, Germany, oh, I actually know our wine. From Sonoma County, we look forward to toasting again, together, in person, when the time is right. We'll save you a seat. Very nice. I'm glad people got a chance to see that. So from all over the world. So we have just a few minutes. Thank you, Todd, uh, to kind of close things out here. And I'm going to turn to you, Terry. Uh, take us out 12 months. Uh, how might our economy, business, and social life be different from what we, what we were used to? Wow. Isn't that the question, right? Um, I think, you know, look, I think we're in for a year or two of of transition into some some phase of new normal. Uh, I think that, you know, the hospitality and restaurant industry are going to really just have to step up their minimum, I'll just call it sanitary state and, uh, to attract mm -hmm. clients at all. And there'll be an elevated state of all of that. Yes. Um, I think we're going to see some companies under increased distress. I think we're going to find, unfortunately, that some of the banks uh, in the next couple of months and after the second quarter will probably be forced not to be so nice. Uh, again, another reason to be close to your banks, but we're also going to see some really cool innovation. Um, so I think we're going to see the birth of some new services within companies that exist today. I think we'll see new companies emerge that haven't existed before that might provide uh, mobility and connectivity and security in a, mo in a more mobile and connected state. Um, so I think we're going to see a mix of some really tough things and a mix of some really exciting things emerge. Um, but stay, stay close to your bank, stay close to your people and the company, stay really close to your vendors and customers. Um, if you've got 20% of your customers that make up 80% of your revenue, call them, make sure they're okay uh, and make sure you know what to expect from them. Um, and if I, if you'll permit me, Brad, I'll take like maybe 60 seconds. I'm seeing as is always the case, there's lots of Q and a, we just couldn't get to, um, I'm gonna address a couple things that may help a couple of those questions really quick. Uh, so number one, there were some questions around wh what's going to happen in the next, uh, in, in the sort of the forgiveness period, that eight week period, which is a little bit different for everyone, right? When they got, they got funded. Um, the, the guidance, and one of the questions directly was, will the rules change in this period? Um, and they, they most certainly will. Uh, and I think they're gonna get more embellished and more specific from the guidance. So stay close to this FAQ document that's on the treasury site. Um, I think that if you can stay a little bit nimble and open-minded about your expenses in the final half of the, um, of the forgiveness period, that will probably serve you well. Uh, and I think we'll probably see some, some guidance continue in the next week or two around how do you do all that. And again, hopefully the bank can provide some assistance on how they'll be administering the, the, uh, the forgiveness itself with documents and they'll probably have a portal like they did for the applications. Um, uh, finally, I, I, there was just a, a whole host of questions that I'll just call the, the mechanics of what to do in the forgiveness and how to see particular parts of it. Um, we, those are the questions we've been fielding. So, you know, please, please reach out to me. I'm very happy to, uh, to try to get to all of those if we can uh, offline. Great. Thank you again so much, Terry. Uh, Todd, uh, uh, maybe about 30 seconds on where you see everything changing in the next year or so. Yeah, very similar to Terry's comments. I think this is going to be um, probably a, a rolling crescendo, if that's even a thing, um, where, you know, depending on how the shelter in place restrictions begin to lift, um, we'll obviously start to see a, a reopening of the tourism economy. Um, but it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a while and there's going to be maybe some, you know, back and forth a little bit, depending on the, the health implications of, um, you know, just in general, not relating specifically to the tourism economy, but just how we see our numbers in, in Sonoma County um, 
But I, I really think, you know, like we keep talking about Sonoma County and the North Bay being a really resilient area, so too is our industry. I mean, we, we weathered lots of economic storms, whether it's 9-11 or our fires or the Great Recession. And so we'll continue to see a lot of innovation um, from our from our industry um, as you know because ours as as we saw um, you know has, our industry has been particularly affected by all of this and so it's going to be incumbent on us more, now more than ever to be um, innovative so that we are able to welcome visitors back here and, and take care of our, our local small businesses and others. Well once again Todd, Terry thanks so much for being with us. We promised we'd have you off of here by 1130 Again, give a little virtual wave to uh, the sponsors that made this possible for this to be free uh, to all of, all of you and all the public, uh, American River Bank, Bank of Marin, EPM, Interwest Insurance Services, and Poppy Bank, and Redwood Credit Union. Thank you to them. And then our partners, North Bay Leadership Council, Metro, Center as a Metro Chamber, the San Rafael Chamber of Commerce, and the Sonoma County Alliance. Thank you for being with us. This is the beginning for us at the Business Journal. Uh, again, 40 under 40 next Thursday, gonna have a lot of fun with a bunch of videos and um, we appreciate you being with us and stay tuned for more industry conferences in the weeks and months ahead. Thank you for being with us and stay safe and know that you're all in our thoughts. Thanks so much, goodbye now.